Um, so let me give a few kind of background words of, of introduction on the issue, and, th and then I'd like to kind of weave uh, a very brief introduction of each of our panelists in, in relation to that, that broader description of the issue. Um, so I'm extremely happy to be here, so thank you for to Jamie and KI and, and TACD for um, for this meeting, but you know, more importantly, for the for the years of leadership on this issue and, and combining consumer groups from from you know these two regions of the world uh, in in advocacy, public interest advocacy on these issues has just been extremely instrumental, and and to some extent is really leading up to this moment now. You know, we have a, an agreement being negotiated between the U.S. and EU, and it was with incredible foresight from both the organizations and the funders involved to create this organization early in the process so that we can come here now with the with the agreement being negotiated, already mobilized, already knowing each other, already with the research and activist base behind us. So I, I just think, you know, everyone that's been part of this, pro this process deserves um, you know, a note of congratulation. Um, you know, my own interest into, into public uh, interest issues uh, in intellectual property really started uh, in the access to medicines field, you know, which is the second panel that we'll have today. Um, and I became engaged in the digital rights issues really with ACTA um, in 2009, 2010. Um, oh, there were access to medicine concerns within that agreement. Um, but some of the some of the most explosive concerns were actually on the digital side, and initially my interest was in um, organizing a group of academics around the secrecy issues. You know, trying to um, lead some some different voices, organize some different voices in opposition to the secrecy in which uh, ACTO was being negotiated. But but quickly that that group of, of academics and professors, people like Michael Geis, Peter Yazzie, other people working on this issue, um, started being interested in going below the secrecy issues and actually trying to get hold of the text and analyzing it from a, from an academic perspective, from a perspective of groups of people who study these issues and might have something to to contribute to the analysis of some of the uh, specifics being negotiated from people who who study the law. Um, not necessarily from any given perspective, but from the perspective of a, a, new, a, a somewhat neutral analyzer of, of the legal field and, and how it impacts societies in general. That, that process led to a document that I've, that I've put um, on the tables and back. I don't know if there's enough copies for everybody, but it was in 2010, um, after a, a series of, of activities by, by groups of people in this room, um, pushed the European Parliament uh, to to pass a March 2010 resolution calling for the negotiators to release the text of the agreement. The text of the agreement was released in, in April 2010 uh, with, with bracket, brackets on, on issues to still being negotiated, etc. But that provided an official vehicle uh, for analysis. And a, a group of, of academics and activists, a lot of the people in this room, in fact I met a lot of the people in this room at that meeting, uh, came together at, at American University where I work and spent about three or four days um, breaking out into a series of different workshops and meetings and, and going over that, that text, that officially released text, and identifying specific problems in the text. And there, there are at least two sections that, that mirror what we're talking about today. There's a section on the internet and there's a section on access to medicines. And I wanted to just um, highlight some of the things that were that were stated in that declaration because I think we'll be both hearing similar concerns being raised now so one of the questions will will the controversial and critiqued provisions of ACTA reappear in this new agreement between the US and EU and then a, a second group um, of, of analysis that we'll hear to today is what about the new issues that we weren't looking at then but that we should be looking at now so in that, what we call the urgent communique on ACTA, probably the operative sentence was that we find that the terms of the publicly released draft of ACTA threatens numerous public interests, including every concern specifically disclaimed by negotiators. And it, and it kind of goes through specifically some of those, those claims. And then, and then a, a key uh, point was that ACTA is, is a predict, predictably deficient product of a deeply fraught process. And that 
what started as a relatively simple proposal to coordinate customs enforcement has transformed into a sweeping and complex new international intellectual property and internet regulation. And I think that's a, a key thing to think about as we hear that this agreement won't go into controversial areas or it's going to bracket these kind of issues. That was what was being stated in the lead up to ACTA and it was only after the text started being released that we realized that was not true. It was not a customs coordination agreement. It was an IP minimum standards agreement. Uh, any agreement of this scope and consequence must be based on a broad and meaningful consultative process in public, on the record, with open, ongoing access to pr proposed negotiating texts and must reflect a full range of public interest concerns. And I think that um, has been a rallying cry for you know the academic groups that I work with since then, and, we, and we've signed multiple letters uh, to the U.S. trade negotiators, to the Senate, repeating that similar kind of concern in relation to the TTP and also in relation to the TTIP. And I, and I think it, um, it, it bears to remember that, that the, the resistance to providing that kind of a process was one of the key reasons ACTA failed, that, that it delegitimated the product by having an illegitimate process. And I think we still win on that issue as long as um, a legitimate process is not followed. And then quickly on the internet, so that, that in reference to the internet, ACTA would encourage internet service providers to police the activity of internet users by holding internet providers responsible for the actions of subscribers, conditioning safe harbors on adopting uh, policing policies and requiring parties to encourage cooperation between service providers and rights holders. And our, our first, um, Speaker today, uh, Costas, and, um, and some of the European names I'm going to anglophile, <laughs> but Rosso <Boo. laughs> um, <clears throat> from the European Consumers Bureau, um, will speak about that issue particularly. So, you know, the idea that, that you would have terms promoting voluntary cooperation has actually led to specific outcomes in the, in the internet governance community in both the European um, and America, and, and he will be speaking on that. Um, we also noted that it would encourage surveillance and potential punitive disconnections by private actions and globalized anti-circumvention provisions. So those are issues that I think we'll hear more um, about from, um, from Jeremy at EFF that works a lot on, on these kind of uh, circumvention uh, issues, etc. and Carolina Rossini from Public Knowledge who at any minute will come gracing in right before her, her talk starts. Um, and then some new issues, so, so Gail uh, Kerkorian, who works in the European Parliament, will talk about trade secrets, which was notably absent from any of this discussion at the time we were analyzing ACTA. But a lot of these agreements have trade secret mandatory minimum standards within them, and consumers have massive interest within the trade secret realm. I mean, one issue that I, that I know about glancingly is if you want to know what, what fracking people are putting in your water, then you got to get over trade secrets because all of that information is covered by trade secret. And then finally, James Love, um, who we all know from, from KEI, and we'll have him go last on the panel to kind of give a, a, a summary or ask some questions and kind of keep our discussion going there. So he's going to be the, the cleanup hitter for today and is, and is not restrained in any way from any, from any subject that he may want to um, approach. So with that, let me start with Costas and we'll go down and we have um, about an hour and 15 minutes left. So I think two, four, six.